Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Design in Dialogue. Uh, my name is Glenn Adamson, a frequent host here on the program. And I know it's been a while since we've been with you, but we have a great reason to be back. The current exhibition at Friedman Bend Gallery in Chelsea in New York, which is called Everything Here is Volcanic. It's curated by Mario Ballesteros, who's here with us today as our guest. And this will be the first in a series of four interviews that we'll have first, of course, here with Mario and then with three designers participating in the show. Uh, Mario will be capably leading two of those interviews and then uh, our colleague Stephen Burks will be uh, doing an interview with Frito Escobar. So um, a great contribution um, as the exhibition itself is to international awareness of what is happening in the super exciting Mexican design scene. Mario, welcome to the show. Hi, Glenn. Thank you. Very excited to be part of Design in Dialogue. Likewise. And you're coming to us from Mexico City, correct? Yeah, I'm back in Mexico City after a very exciting time in, in New York. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's get right into it. I know we have a lot of images to uh, look at. Um, and um, thank you very much for, for uh, bringing them together. Um, the um, way we thought we'd start actually is, um, let me just get this PowerPoint up. There we go. Um, the way that we thought we'd start actually is with a little bit of a general conversation about um, the formation of design in Mexico before we get onto your own projects. So starting with this uh, rather attractive piece of footwear. <laughs> Very discreet first image. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wanted to pull some, some of these images together because I think it's important. Um, the way I approach uh, any sort of project or question about the nature of design in Mexico, I always, find myself going back and sometimes way back uh, into histories, into material culture, and just like uh, getting a sense of what making means in Mexico, I think is very important to understand the contemporary context. So uh, this is obviously um, a, a vernacular sort of object. It's a traditional huarache. Uh, and I think um, looking back to sort of traditional craft, indigenous craft, and traditions of making in Mexico is a very important uh, source of understanding and sort of meaning when we're talking about contemporary design. Uh, but also if we look at the next image, um, so I would say that the history of modern design in Mexico and its own sort of relationship and reinterpretation of craft or incorporation of making traditions is also a very important source for contemporary designers and makers and artists in Mexico. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, butaque chair by Clara Porcet, which is actually in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, it was also, um, as we were discussing earlier, featured in uh, a show, a recent show by Zoe Ryan, who's also been part of the series. And I think this is uh, an incredible example of how even in sort of the more recent history of design in the 20th century in Mexico, these sort of ancient sources and traditional ways of making are still very present. And then if we jump to the next image, um, which this is actually a, a, a piece, a work by Pedro Reyes that's part of the Everything Here is Volcanic exhibition at Friedman Benda right now. Um, this really is, could be, if you don't have context or you don't know the work of Pedro, you, you could really sort of strive to understand and identify this object as a contemporary um, artwork. Uh, and I think Pedro's work is very clear in that also that incorporation and that sort of a temporal confusion uh, where you don't really know if um, sort of the main source is uh, a contemporary sort of concern or if it's an ancient sort of object or materiality. And just the last image, which I think is very evocative in a very different sense. This is a, a beautiful chair by Manuel Reder. Um, who did produce this uh, chair in the residency in Oaxaca. So it's just a regular monoblock plastic chair um, with a woven sort of seat cover. It obviously not only integrates all these different factors of the anonymous or the popular design, the contemporary, but also uh, winks to the Campana brothers. Um, so I really love this example. And I think the last two, Pedro's piece and this piece, 
are very different approaches, but in a same in a, in a sort of strange way, they have the same sort of resonance of past, present, future, um, authorship, popular sort of collective know-how, um, and I think that's what is always interesting to me about contemporary making in Mexico. Can I ask you a question, Mario, um, prompted by the your mention of Campana Brothers? and also Zoe Ryan's show uh, in a cloud on a wall in a chair, uh, the artist Institute of Chicago, um, which was really about the exchange between American, and, which is to say from the United States designers uh, in Mexico City at mid-century. And here you're pointing to a Mexican designer nodding to a Brazilian um, studio. How do you think about um, the intellectual project of understanding Mexican design as something either intrinsic to the nation or on the contrary, as a kind of crossroads of cosmopolitan trajectories, influences? How do you think your way through that always tricky problem? Hmm. Um, yeah, that's not, a, not an easy question to answer. And I think it's, it's sort of the eternal question. That's sort of the permanent tension, I think, in, uh, in, in contemporary production in Mexico to this day. And it was there in the 1920s and it was there uh, before even uh, the Mexican Revolution. And I think that's, um, I, I would say that the presence of that question and sort of that permanent tension between what is Mexican and what is universal or what is global, because no one uses the word universal anymore, um, but sort of that tension and that um, sort of difficulty of understanding what is ours and how we are part of something larger um, has been present um, forever, practically, in, 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 in production and in material culture and in design and in art in Mexico. And I think even when, um, especially people from my generation or younger generations are very much sort of fed up with that question. They don't really um, explicitly at least address that question in their work. It's still something that is viscerally and materially and sort of um, maybe unspoken, but it's still very present, I think, in, in production in Mexico. Um, and I think that's part of also the drive behind the show and I don't think there's an answer but what I usually like to do is just um, sort of organize different perspectives and different views and different ways of addressing that question some are more explicit so some are more implicit um, but it's something that for people that haven't been to Mexico that don't know much about Mexican history um, or might not know anything about Mexico, there's something very immediate and visceral that marks a difference from the way we understand objects, materiality, um, aesthetics, uh, color, all these different factors that really make production in Mexico, I think, unique. Great. And in fact, um, our next couple of slides give us a very compressed version of that history you just mentioned. In fact, this um, image does take us all the way back in the way back machine uh, to, to the 1920s. Yeah, again, I mean, and this happens to me when when I was working on the Friedman Benda show, but usually when I'm working on a on an exhibition about Mexican design, um, <clears throat> I go back to this very important um, exhibition that happened in 1921. So this is a photo of the first sort of Mexican popular arts exhibition. Uh, which was promoted by the Mexican government right after the revolution in 1921 for the celebration of the centennial of the independence of Mexico, which was from the in the early 1820s. Um, and this is a very important um, sort of moment in the history of uh, exhibitions in Mexico because it's the first. So this was a, a popular crafts show showing traditional clay, pottery, uh, leatherwork, textiles uh, from across the country. And it was the first exhibition that traveled from Mexico after the revolution to the US um, in 1922. 
um, promoted by Catherine M. Porter, who was a journalist from Texas that was living in Mexico at the time, um, and a bunch of other intellectual sort of figures from, from these um, very active years. Actually, in the, in the photo, we have uh, Javier Guerrero, who later would marry Clara Porcet. Um, and it was um, a moment where really we started identifying crafts and indigenous production as part of our modern identity, which I think is still a very present sort of um, <clears throat> issue in, in Mexican production. This image is, um, so this is an exhibition from 1952, a few decades after that first one, um, organized by Clara Porcet, um, first in Bellas Artes, in the um, Palace of Fine Arts, which is uh, which was originally housing uh, the opera, but is now one of the main sort of institutions, museums in the country. Um, and it was also shown in the National University, which was built, finished in 1952, and also one of these great sort of state-driven um, sort of statements for <laughs> modern Mexico. And what's incredible about this exhibition is that Porcet really, um, she very intelligently articulated this um, constant of the handmade and craft and uh, understood it as an important source for um, the identity of modern Mexico and for modern design specifically, um, just as important as industrial production. So this show, which was called Art en la Vida Diaria, Art in Daily Life, is also sort of a very important reference that I always keep coming back to. And that idea of art immersed in, the, in daily life and completely embedded into um, sort of domestic existence, let's say, um, is also very present in, in, in sort of pre-Hispanic cultures because as Catherine M. Porter and also another female intellectual, which is very interesting, the three women have been very important references for sort of my perspective. Uh, Anita Brenner, she spoke of living arts. Uh, so there was no word in, in pre-Hispanic cultures, there was no, no word for art. Art was just completely embedded in either ritual, so ritual objects, or sort of practical everyday objects. And I think that's a very interesting sort of difference. And that's a difference that I really like to push um, when when I put together a show, and that I think was very present in the Friedman Bendit show as well. Well, indeed, uh, even beyond that in the field right now, I would have said that that kind of holistic attitude to art, design, material, culture, the textures of living, that is sort of an aspirational goal for the discipline at this point, uh, for reasons ranging from climate change to uh, cross-cultural hybridization, you name it, that that ideal that you just described as um, quite anciently rooted in this place yeah. seems also extremely contemporary, which is fascinating. It feels like a, a, one of the main drivers of your work curatorially. Definitely, definitely. And it, it really is very evocative of these confusions of temporalities and contexts, but just a, a really strong sense and meaning for our sort of contemporary conditions. So this is a show I curated in Bellas Artes, the only design show uh, to happen in this space after Clara Porcet. So it was Porcet in 1952. And then a show I did in 2019 for the Mexican Design Open, which is a really interesting uh, design festival, uh, uh, um, a sort of very horizontal democratic open um, design festival. Uh, here in Mexico City. And this show was called Pop Populista Popular. So the theme I selected for that uh, year's festival was Popular, which is pretty much how what we call, ver we don't use the word vernacular so much. We use Popular, uh, which was a very sort of conscious effort in the 1920s to tie sort of indigenous craft to sort of popular uh, um, sort of working class identity. Um, and this show was a really incredible exercise of bringing together. So we had um, ancient artifacts 
from the collection of the National Indigenous uh, Institute. Uh, we had uh, sort of anonymous informal designers, let's say this jersey, for example, is by Jorge Campos, who was a goalkeeper in the 90s, and he designed his own um, sort of uniforms, which I think is fantastic. Uh, and we also had contemporary designers working with sort of the same um, sort of perspectives and materials. And so this happy confusion, I think, is very much uh, what represents the most interesting uh, aspects of, of contemporary production for, for me in terms of design. I love you have the Fernando La Paz right next to the Clara Porset that we've already seen, that, that sort of conversation over time. That's it's yes. really brilliant. Yes. Um, Fernando La Paz, another designer that will be well known to folks following Friedman Benda's program. Yes. And yeah, I mean, this this show, I think, was pretty radical also. And it's like the boldness of, of the color. The green actually was very present in the 90s in Mexico for taxis and for like buses in the city. So <laughs> we really wanted to, you have these beautiful marble sort of like de art deco interiors in Bellas Artes, the murals, which are like UNESCO heritage. And then we wanted to throw in like t-shirts and uh you know pesero green and just really sort of give a space in sort of high culture to these expressions because i think it's very difficult to understand mexico as a place if you don't delve into these sort of uh realities and it was really an incredible show because it's a very popular museum so lots of people go there on sundays people that don't have anything to do with like sort of high-end design. And it was a really incredible uh, experience. I wanted to bring in this image. This is, this is by Sangre. These are cell phone covers, but they're do, done like as if they were like pre-Hispanic jewelry with uh, shells and like precious materials uh, by Sangre, who are also part of the Friedman Bender show. And I love these um, pieces. You know, one thing, if I just go back to um, this image for a second, one thing that strikes me about this project as well is that it points to something different in the formation of visual culture in Mexico as opposed to the United States, at least from my point of view, in that if we think of pop art in this country, it's so dominated by multinational brands and mm -hmm. inflecting the concept of pop and pop design through the idea of popular, which is more vernacular, maybe more grassroots, certainly more of a, a street presence rather than a kind of imposed corporate presence. That does feel like a very important difference in the energies that we're dealing with here now. Definitely, definitely. And we wanted to play with pop also as, as that precise sort of difference and differentiation. And I think pop culture in Mexico definitely has to do with craft. It has to do with bootlegging. It has to do with a different kind of appropriation of lots of maybe pop industrial references or aspirations. But when they land in Mexico, they become something else. So you have a bootleg sort of pair of sneakers or, you know, uh, a sort of mish, mishmash mix of music uh, that takes samples and takes different sort of sources. So yeah, definitely a, that was a play that we wanted to emphasize as well. Yeah. Well, I think listeners are already, um, <laughs> this is a very hot point <laughs> <laughs> on every level to what we were talking about. But um, we, we've already talked uh, a little bit about your interest in history and taking the kind of capacious view of the subject. And that is obviously extremely important to the way that you've approached your work at Archivo. So maybe you could talk yeah. us through that uh, project as well. So Archivo, I think, was really uh, the space where... Um, so Archivo is used to be a private collection. Uh, it was a space founded by Fernando Romero, the architect, and Sumaya Slim. Uh, it was their sort of personal design collection. And in 2000, around 2012, they started working on this project of opening up their collection uh, to the public, uh, as we don't have in Mexico, unfortunately, a dedicated museum for design. Um, so this is a beautiful house built in the 1950s by Arturo Chavez Paz, uh, a very little known architect. It's right next door to Luis Barragan's own house studio in this sort of magical little corner of Mexico City uh, with a beautiful garden, as you can see, that was originally designed by Barragan himself, uh, in fact. Um, and so this was a sort of archive 
it used to be a house, but then it turned into an archive um, sort of collection uh, and exhibition space. I um, became director of Archivo in 2015. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, you can see that the project in its first years was sort of very focused on gather in, in creating an industrial design collection. So we had about 3,500 um, maybe objects and, and, and works uh, from mostly 20th century, lots of sort of industrial anonymous design, but also some important works by international, internationally renowned designers. Um, and what I tried to do is instead of focusing so much on the permanent collection itself, we started uh, hosting a program of exhibitions that really wanted to, to sort of challenge the sort of strict divisions of design as a practice, because that's something that I think is very present in Mexico and I guess elsewhere, um, where design sort of doesn't really interact much with other creative disciplines with art, with architecture, um, not even with graphic design or other types of, of design itself. So instead of this is this is um, a photo of our storage, which we was also open to the public. So students could actually come in and, you know, see the Pedro Friedebergs or see the Noel chairs or see the, you know, sit on uh, sit on them and really understand the objects themselves uh, so that was a, a very nice part of the project um, in the next slides i think we also had a library um, this is another part of the open um, we called it the open archive so it was our sort of objects library that we uh, curated um, as well as the exhibitions um, but really what was most interesting for me in, in Archivo was the main sort of exhibitions. I think there's a couple of images after. This is the reading room, which was designed by Fabian Capello, who also is um, has been very well known in, in Mexico for some time now. Um, the website, which was a big part of our efforts, uh, which is unfortunately not up anymore. <laughs> Um, but the website was really uh, a reflection of just like the diversity and the, the richness of the program and of the space. Um, and it really became more than just an exhibition space. It became a, a, a space for the community that was lacking in, in Mexico. Uh, it became a space of collaborations and questions. And really, we said uh, that we like to think of Archivo as a place for collecting, for exhibiting, but also rethinking design and redefining sort of what design can be. Mm. And I suppose you were also um, working with an audience that didn't necessarily have a lot of existing design history. So it wasn't maybe an opportunity to tell a canonical story about design for the first time in a much more capacious way. So it, it, it's, I mean, you call it rethinking, but in some ways you were also getting a chance to think it from scratch, you know? Definitely, definitely. And I think what, what really drove us was to sort of push for this understanding of design as a cultural practice, um, because sometimes schools just focus sort of on the professional sort of functional formation aspects and don't really delve into the culture and the history of design that much. So it was definitely part of, of the intention for us. Um, this is just a, a, a sketch by Apra de Lesp, which is a young architecture office. Well, they're youngish now, <laughs> they're not that young anymore. Uh, they actually just won the, the competition to um, sort of curate the Mexican pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale next year, or this year, sorry. Um, and this was an incredible show uh, because it was really asking ourselves about the, the nature of what a place like Archivo um, was. So the premise was Italian design in the Archivo collection, just because I think we opened in October 2015 uh, and Design Week in Mexico that year had Italy as a guest sort of country. So I was like, oh, simple. Let's just figure out what what pieces of Italian design we have in the collection. And we didn't have that much, to be honest. Um, so what these guys did, they were like, okay, let's take the Italian objects, but let's really think of Archivo as a resource. So 
you can see in this plan that the actual Italian pieces uh, in the collection were on this table right there in the middle. Uh, and then everything that wasn't Italian, we decided to bring down and out of storage and put it in the in the main exhibition space as well. So we had this crazy chicken wire mesh volume with the entire collection. <laughs> if you go to the next picture, which I'm sure uh, sort of people who are dedicated to conservation <laughs> are freaking out right now <laughs> looking at this. But it was it was a it was a pretty radical gesture, but it made sense because all these objects were no one had seen them. No one really knew what we had in our collection. Um, some of them were not in the best sort of state of conservation. They were plasti wrapped, and so it was really uh, a gesture of bringing everything out to put everything back together and to reshape the way the space functioned. So after we did this, we opened up the storage uh, in the upstairs and um, and it was really just an incredible exercise. So we also uh, invited uh, different uh, studios because I wanted to do sort of a wink to Emilio Ambas's The New Domestic Landscape at a micro scale. <laughs> Um, and so we invited at the at the time Space Caviar, Saluto Buono, and Fig Projects to propose sort of non-objectual interventions. So uh, it was a really really interesting show, um, and this is a beautiful uh, gesture that these guys did as well. This is like one of the big highways that's right next to to the house. Uh, and if you see that little window there, if you go to the next slide, uh, what, what they wanted to do, they opened a little cafe in the garden so that people could peek inside from the street, uh, which is not the main entrance, to the garden, order a coffee, and also have a coffee in, inside Archivo. So that really was, it became a permanent, actually, uh, coffee <laughs> that we, we installed. So yeah. it was just this very sort of, visceral fun but sort of radical and very sort of intellectual in a way approach to what an institution like this had to be yeah it, i guess once you introduce a coffee shop to a place it never leaves right <laughs> but um it's so interesting too mario because it makes me think about the parallels between italian design history and mexican design history which is maybe not a su subject that has gotten a lot of attention but you know clara porcet's work obviously is paralleled by you know the um the big italian design exhibition that traveled in america in the early 1950s then you have the new domestic landscape obviously marking another moment in uh conceptual or radical design practice so so interesting that you went back to that yeah i mean i think that's a personal bias i'm obsessed with like italian design in general since gioponti uh, up to the radicals of the 60s and 70s and yeah I was also like part of my own history is also tied to Italy in a strange way I was editor of uh, Mexican edition of Domus uh, before I came to Archivo so um, yeah I've, I've been dealing with that sort of those parallels for a while and I do think Italy in a way uh, I mean even like the most famous pop songs in Mexico are originally originally Italian which is strange like Maldita Primavera and like all these romantic singers from the 80s they're just covers of Italian sort of <laughs> ballads from the 70s um, but definitely I think there's there's similarities and links and and for me I think the way Italian design has evolved is very similar in the sense of having to deal with a deep, complicated history and that challenge of what it means to be contemporary or modern. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, in, in, in a way, I think there are parallels, definitely. And also the question of where the artisanal fits within that. So if you have a, a, a radical project, you know, I, I always think about the fact that Memphis furniture, despite its very camera ready, kind of magazine-like aesthetic was all hand-built by a cabinet maker because how else were you going to do it, you know? So there's exactly. this, which exactly. everything is a prototype, you know? And and that happened in Mexico, like now that you mentioned that, like Juan O'Gorman, our first sort of modern 
rationalist architect in the 1920s. He faked industrial finishes, making them by hand just to, I mean, mo modernity and, and functionalism in Mexico was sort of theatrics in a way, <laughs> because we didn't have that industrial context or production. And it made more sense to do everything by hand uh, yeah. and fake it <laughs> till we made it. <laughs> so just a few um, images from shows at Archivo. Uh, this was a work in progress show that we did, uh, one of the first shows. Uh, and we mixed like all the different projects together. So you didn't, each table had designers that were sort of working on similar either materials or aesthetics or ideas, but we mixed them all together. Um, this is uh, Fernando Laposo's uh, first solo show, which uh, we had in 2019 as well. A uh, very beautiful show called Transmutations. And it was his first show in Mexico. So we went all out. And I was like, for the first time, you don't have to like take one sort of corn leaf in a box to London. You can actually have like a whole uh, sort of mountain of corn and the agave leaves. So it was just these very simple exhibition of the three sort of natural fibers that he works with lufa agave fiber and corn leaf um, and it was about the material the process and then the finished object but it was a, a gorgeous show yeah he's so important just in terms of social impact too so using design as a way of really mm -hmm. um providing livelihood and also addressing ecological damage in in rural mexico so there's many layers to that practice isn't there definitely definitely yeah. And at Archivo, we also played very much with this sort of high-low um, tension, the tensions of temporality. If you go to the next slide, I think these are, yeah, this is uh, a show um, that we worked on with Pablo Leon de la Barra, uh, and it was a series we called Archivos or Archives. Uh, and we sort of tried to reconstruct architecture archives of lesser known buildings or lesser known um, architects. And this is uh, a series of photographs from the Camino Real Hotel, which was built in 1968 by um, Ricardo Legorreta. And um, not many people know today that there was a Calder Stabile in the lobby of the Camino Real. And unfortunately it was sold off in auction in the 2000s when the hotel was bought by a, a different owner. Uh, so it was a really incredible show. We found these beautiful uh, photographs by Armando Salas Portugal from when the hotel opened. And it was really, uh, very important also in showing sort of these links between architecture, art, and design. But if you go to the next uh, page, this is what we did. So we built a, <laughs> a knockoff, a knockoff um, calder, not a calder in the in the in the garden. We also on the left. Uh, this is sort of an interpretation of an Annie Albers tapestry, which everyone thought was lost at the time we did the show. And then a year after we did this exhibition for the 50th anniversary of, of the hotel, they found the original tapestry in one of the warehouses of the hotel. So that's back on view. Um, but we did this sort of like crazy things that really pointed to very specific moments in the history of design in Mexico, uh, but were also very playful and sort of accessible. Um, on the left, it's sort of furniture that was auctioned off also in the 2000s, originally from the hotel. So we wanted to recreate sort of a universe uh, in this exhibition. It was a really nice show. It's that temporal laying as layering as well, right? And if, if it doesn't still exist, then you just remake it. So that kind of, uh, yeah, DIY. Yeah. <laughs> Very deal. Yeah. <laughs> I like the, the baragon pink of the sofa too is perfect. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, and this is another example of, of those crossings of history and temporality and sort of seriousness and playfulness. Uh, this was a show we did uh, in only three months. We put it together right after the 2017 earthquake in Mexico City. And it was sh a show about a very iconic building 
um, the SCOP, the Secretaría de Comunicaciones y Obras Públicas, which had these incredible murals by Juan Gorman, the same murals that are the same system of murals, let's say, that are um, on the national on the facade of the National Library. If you go to the next slide, you can see. I think we have a. This is a, a Pedro Reyes piece. Uh, that he's incorporating that technique of the stone mosaic murals that Ogorman sort of invented uh, in these one by one meter panels. So they could actually be removed. And the, the, the idea of the show was this building was damaged in 1985. Um, a, a big part of the murals, which are also very important in the history of arts in Mexico, were damaged at the time. And what they decided in 1986 was to rebuild the building as it was uh, and redo some of the murals that had been damaged. And then in 2017, on the exact same day of the 1985 earthquake, we had another huge earthquake uh, and the building was damaged again. So the show was really a speculation of what could be done to sort of safeguard these murals, how preservation has to be different in a place like Mexico where you know the same building can fall down twice on the same day in a in a span of 20 years which is incredible to think about um and it was sort of a speculative preservation show um there was a model of the airport which has now been cancelled uh, and Pedro Reyes and Fernando Romero had a proposal to sort of move the murals to the airport it was a really interesting very controversial show as well. You know, I'm really glad, Mario, that we're getting this deep dive into your practice because it shows me that in addition to your expertise in Mexican design, which is, of course, very important and special, you also have a really unique curatorial voice that seems to pivot from one methodology to another. So here you're really thinking about architectural preservation, but then in another project, you just chucked the entire collection to you know a chicken wire cage and it, it's like you're <laughs> modeling different attitudes to artifacts um which i i dare say is something that really only a design curator would do instinctively because i, I feel like art curators are necessarily bound by the intentions of the artists that they work with which is understandable and right and maybe there's something here about design curation is having actually more options available to it more uh flexibility and its potential methodologies and i really feel like at archivo you were really <laughs> yeah for it. Oh, definitely. we went for it and i think that's not only sort of like my personal sort of drive but but i think it's very reflective of the context as well like yeah. an informal institution like archivo where we had three people no budgets and just like sort of an open sort of possibility where we could do these crazy things. Um, and also I've, I'm, I've always been drawn to that issue of informality and how informal design and construction in Mexico is so mm. impactful. So in my own practice as a curator, I do see myself as sort of self-taught and self-constructed in a way, if that makes sense. Uh, and, and yeah, I think it's an important part of what also, uh, a context like Mexico offers. Yeah. That concept of auto construction that I know is important in the sculpture world in Mexico too, that, you know, again, it's the DIY ethos, Definitely. but DIY sort of supercharged through the imagination, you know? Definitely. Yeah. This is just another really quickly, a, a piece by Tercero and Quinto who are trained as architects, but sort of conceptual artists and what they did this is the square of the of this building uh in 2017 and they removed there was a big crack after the earthquake and so they removed these stones from the pavement and if you go to the next one uh they built a mural in archivo with those stones mm -hmm. so it's just like these i mean yeah for me this this is very important uh to really um, not only dig deep, but go far in how you, how far you can push uh, these contexts and these sort of strange historic situations to make people think about preservation or think about identity or think about uh, high and low, you know? I, I guess it's right in the name of the organization too, that if it has one kind of manifesto-like principle, it's not forgetting, right? Yeah some kind of uh it's like you're doing some kind of memory work 
uh, in every project, but in very different ways. Super inspiring. Yeah. Here we brought in. Uh, so this was a series that we did in 2017, and it was a series of three shows called Mexico Design City. MXCD, and we played with the acronym because the Mexico City was rebranded as CDMX oh, in yeah. this, this time. So we inverted the acronym MXCD, and we did a series of three shows when Mexico was nominated as World Design Capital. Uh, and on we wanted to really understand why or what Mexico City brought to the table. So we did three shows, one on the present, on the past, and on the future of design in Mexico City specifically through three years, which was something that we never did. Like all our shows we put together in three months. Um, and this was the first show and we brought in like, I think it was a ton of, this is shredded plastic on the floor. It's trash basically that we got from a recycling plant. Uh, so this was a, 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 a scenography created by Palma. We invited three different architecture offices to think of the setting of these shows. This was the present show. So we had these contemporary objects laying on a sea of trash, which was pretty evocative as well. Mm. Um, this is the past show, which was called 100 uh, Fragments, 100 Years. Uh, and it was sort of challenging the notion of design history in Mexico as something that was very recent, only from maybe the 60s or 70s on. Uh, and this was by Tesontle, who are also uh, an important part of the Friedman Benda show. And they wanted to create sort of a cabinet of curiosities uh, uh, vertically also in the space, because it's, the space is quite small. It's like 100 square meters. Uh, so putting in like 100 objects into this small space was, was a challenge as well. And Mario, we should mention you'll be interviewing Tazantle as part of this series. So. Yes, they'll be part of this yeah. series as well. This is a little uh, sort of vignette that we did referencing Clara Porcet's Art in Daily Life show. So we managed to get some of the works that were in that show as well. Beautiful. Mm. And this is the future show. So this uh, was by uh, the architects were Escobedo Solis. Uh, by this time, we had almost no budget. <laughs> after the, after the Tesontle show, we had very little budget to produce. Uh, so they did this really simple but bold uh, sort of scenography with plastic tarps. They stripped away the floorboards of the gallery space and created furniture and exhibition uh, sort of um, bases with the floorboards. Uh, and this was the future show. So it we it was spec a speculative design show. And I wanted to play a little bit with um, This is Tomorrow, uh, which is a very important exhibition also in the history of sort of arts and design exhibitions. And so we paired together uh, 20 artist designers uh, working in teams uh, and it was a really incredible experience as well. If you go to the next one, there's also other people in the show. On the left is um, Barbara sanchez Kane and Andres Soto, who are both in the Friedman Bender show. Um, but it was a really incredible exercise. And I think at the moment, even we thought it was a really weird show. Like we didn't know how, how to react to it. But in the few years that have passed, I think the show has gotten stronger and more significant, and it really pointed to some certain things. We had like um, a, 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 a an urban design team called Oru work with like this digital media uh, collective called Asco Media, and they did like a speculative uh, sort of MTV on water and water scarcity. So we had like a narco corrido song about water we had this incredible sort of um sex health campaign by Weros, a modeling agency and nafi uh that was sort of a, a, a music design label and they spoke about prep and they spoke about um sort of next day um abortion pills and they spoke about um trans uh hormone therapy so they did these these posters 
uh, about all these issues. And in only five or six years, all these issues are already sort of mainstream um, sort of policy. Uh, so it was a really exciting experience as well. So actually a show about the future that was predictive, which is not always the case by any means. Yeah. I mean, and I think it was more than predictive. It was really about what was already happening, but in a way at the cusp, let's say. Well, you, you know, the, the old cliche, which I think is William Gibson originally that um, the future is already here. It's just not very well distributed. Mm -hmm. So you just gathered it together in one one place perhaps but it, I, I, as we turn now to the um the actual exhibition in Freeman Bend everything here is volcanic I guess it prompts me to ask a, a first question about that show which is whether you would want to characterize its emotional tone as optimistic as pessimistic as a combination as um you know an expression of a dynamic up-and-coming design scene or one that's already sort of got a kind of maturity under its belt and is beginning to have a, a sort of um you know set of questions or conversations with itself about its yeah definitely how, how would you characterize all that I mean I think it's both I think it's both like sort of creative and destructive it's mm -hmm. it's optimistic but there's also like a dark streak um and I think it's just very raw and sort of difficult to um sort of categorize or label and which is the essence of the show and it, which is why I also think the title is so evocative and such an incredible way to encapsulate uh, what's the exhibition sort of presents and I can't take credit for the title it's it's a phrase by Hannes Meyer who's another incredible figure in the history of design and modern architecture globally, uh, who very few people know lived in Mexico for a decade, uh, from 1938 to 1948. Uh, and it's a phrase he writes in a letter to a friend, uh, right after he had been fired from his position, like only after a few months after arriving in Mexico, the political ch climate changed completely in the city from being very left wing uh, government with Cardenas to a more sort of right wing capitalist government. Uh, so his vision of Mexico as this place where he could finally build his uh, sort of project of radical, functional, social architecture uh, in a matter of months was completely <laughs> um, discarded. Uh, but regardless of that, he stayed for, for another 10 years. And he writes this letter saying everything here in Mexico is vulcanish. Uh, and he was obviously talking about the landscape and the geography of the country itself, but also about this sort of overwhelming, chaotic, explosive energy that he saw in politics, in culture, in yeah. society. Yeah. And I think we're still in the same, on the same boat, you know, we're still seeing that same sort of chaos, precariousness, uh, uncertainty. But in a way, what happens here is instead of freezing in front of chaos, we sort of thrive on it for some reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's such a great metaphor too, because it's it sort of suggests that if you think things are stable, just wait a minute and whether you like it or not, they'll be upended or upturned. And then the question yeah. is, how do you work generatively within that kind of unpredictability which yeah. obviously is not just a mexican <laughs> condition of the present right of so yeah. you're, you're sort of placing a focus on a certain uh quality in uh global design now and um we should say to those who don't know this is a an absolute masterwork in the show by tazantle yes um, which is just i guess it's just about making tacos no yeah, it's 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 basically a, a vernacular, their interpretation of a vernacular kitchen. Um, but I think this object is so crucial. Like like when they proposed this, I saw the show come together. Uh, and for me, it was really important because the show is about sort of this generation of creators uh, or this group of, of creators, because it's not a single generation, but that I've in some way been following for a long time. And just seeing them evolve into these possibilities. Uh, so this piece, yeah, it's it's a play on the traditional comal, which is the heart of vernacular houses throughout southern Mexico, and it combines it with the grill, which is sort of a northern sort of macho 
uh, sort of artifacts in just this beautiful work of art um, that is used to produce, yeah, a single taco. If you see on the right, they did this little platform where you put your tortilla and just, um, so yeah, I think it's, it's an object that speaks volumes of what we wanted to do with the show and sort of brings together the different energies in the show, which is talking about um, these tensions between the present, the past, the future, where we're going, where we've been, uh, and how we get there, you know? And this can be like one of the most basic uh, domestic rituals of cooking or making a taco. And how do you transform that into sort of an existential answer? You know, I think it's it's an incredible piece. Existential is such a good word because you, you do have the that beautiful turn wood platform that you mentioned on the right. And then this kind of uh, almost quasi-industrial quality because of the metal yeah. that that almost reminds me actually of Atelier Van Lieshoud, another designer we've interviewed on the program. So it, it is at the same time extremely pragmatic and in some ways quite modest actually in its scale. And yet at the same time, it has this kind of monumentality that feels breathtaking when you're in front yeah. of it. Um, it's really mm -hmm. an incredible thing. I'm super looking forward to your conversation with them. And when you're when you light it and when the smoke starts yeah, I can imagine. out of that chimney, it, it does become volcanic. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, yeah, so this yeah. this these are just a few of the of the examples of works we have in the show. And these photographs, I think, speaking with Mark, we really wanted to sort of signal the way they where they're produced and bring some of that energy to the context of New York, which I think even though it's a very, I think the, the installation itself is quite traditional, sort of like white cube. There's nothing, there's no additional noise. But I think these photographs also, and just the objects themselves are so strong that they do end up transporting, I think, yeah. uh, and, and bringing this like crazy context of different parts of Mexico to, to the gallery. Just because um, we have him on the screen, can you talk just a little bit about Senosian for people who aren't aware of his practice? Because he's definitely- Yes, so on the right, we have Javier Senosian, who was, he's an architect. He was born in 1948. So he's, he's, he's in his 70s now. Uh, and he is sort of an outsider in the history of, of architecture in Mexico. And his approach to architecture, he calls his work organic architecture. So he has a very specific particular perspective on nature, environment, and how architecture has to adapt. Um, and the bench on the right, uh, which is also a version of the bench that is in the show, um, is part of uh, a huge park outside of Mexico City, which he's been working on for 20 years, called um, Parque Quetzalcoatl. And so he builds with the same system that he created this bench with, which is just like rebar concrete tile, very simple, very straightforward, uh, hand built everything. Uh, but the result is just this it looks alien almost, you know, it looks like something that came from another planet. Um, and so we're very excited to have, this is the first time he produces this scale of, of furniture, let's say, with the same technique as his buildings. Uh, so it's a very interesting piece that we have in the show. Yeah. It's very simple, but or direct might be a good word, but very intricate also. And, yes. um, you know, the Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, definitely evoked in this amazing set of textures and colors. Yeah. Um, this is a work by Andres Soto, which is uh, very tongue-in-cheek, called Charco, which in Spanish means puddle, but it's obviously sort of a bootleg uh, version of the iconic Arco lamp by Castiglioni, another connection to, to Italy, uh, and just built with the materials of self-constructed housing in Mexico, which about 60% of the built environment in Mexico is informal. Wow. So not built by architects or engineers, but by people themselves. Oh, high number. And it, in, in case people can't see in the image, the shade is a up, just an upturned bucket. That's yeah, still has the plastic bucket. buckets. It's <laughs> a kind of sticker on it from its retail context too. So it is yeah. very much, uh, we're very mm -hmm. much in the world of the um, assisted ready-made here. And the marble is a marble sticker, actually. It's not actually marble. 
So it's cast concrete with a marble sticker. Right, good point. So that's a faux finish on the base there. Yeah, exactly. Um, and also suggests this kind of cinder block. So here we have the installation at the gallery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the show, putting together the show was incredible. It was a long process. We had about two years, I think, mm -hmm. to think about it, speak about it, um, visit the artists and really put together this incredible group of 15 artists across generations from San Ocea into like, we have a couple of 20 year olds in the exhibition as well. Uh, and just really a very diverse group of objects, perspectives, uh, techniques, formats. Like, I don't think there's ever been a writing saddle <laughs> in Friedman Benda. I don't think there will be maybe in the future. Um, but yeah, really challenging also what sort of a contemporary design object is or can be. Uh, and I think that's very clear the moment you enter the, the show. What's amazing to me about it too, Mario, is the way that you um, traverse all of these different aesthetic codes in one exhibition so that you do have these, in some ways, quite folkish or vernacular notes and high color, you know, um, a sense of traditionalism, maybe even creeping in a, a couple of moments. And then you have these super high tech, in some cases, as you can see here, quite aggressive um, yeah you know uses of material and, and a, obviously a much more kind of developed industrial infrastructure that's being alluded to so it yeah. really does capture a lot of the uh, material and visual texture of mexico city you know very very effectively as a show yeah and in, in a way it is for me it's like a concentration of all these previous sort of thought processes influences and and objects that have been in in my exhibitions um and just yeah i think it 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 shouldn't work maybe but somehow it really does uh, this is a beautiful chair obviously by fri escobedo um, we have the two sangre sculptures in stone and ceramics on the sides and then lorena ancona who's an incredible ceramic artist from the yucatan who's researching like the lost intelligence of craft in Yucatan because there's almost no craft production in Yucatan anymore. You have like Tulum and you have Cancun, but you don't really have a big craft center or ceramic center. So she's researching um, and recovering and has discovered uh, both native pigments and uh, clays that she incorporates into her work. Yeah. So yeah, it's also a very different approaches by each one of these designers and aesthetics. Um, but at, in, 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 in a way, they do sort of speak about similar things and they're themes that I think really resonate in the show. I know Stephen will be um, interviewing Frida Escobedo in the series, but um, would you just say one word about the Creek chair and the, the uh, allusion to Ana Mendieta? Because I'm sure people will be. Yeah, there. this is so this is a chair that Frida produced inspired by this work called Creek by Ana Mendieta, who was a Cuban American artist. Um, and she produced this film, this short film in the 70s. And it's just a beautiful film. You can look it up on YouTube, I think. Uh, and uh, so Mendieta is laying nude in a, in a creek and water is rushing past her body. And so the lights and the shimmer of the water pushing against her body uh, has this like metallic quality, which here I think Frida was masterful in her translation and sort of her poetic interpretation of that film and tra tra translating it into uh, an object and the chair is a version sort of an iteration of a bench that she originally designed for a show where um, she was commissioned to design seating for the projection of that video so it's a really beautiful piece well, i didn't realize that connection that's amazing yeah. Yeah. and yet uh, again has a kind of found object quality to it with the ball chain and you know the industrial reference so it speaks to yeah. some objects in the show yeah, so here we see a detail of that on the left and then the wonderful hang piece that you were talking about from Yucatan. Yeah. Yeah. And um, here's our friend Fernando again. Yeah, <laughs> Fernando's work is also super interesting. Uh, so this is actually a, a dead cactus uh, trunk, uh, which is the base of this lamp. And it ties to his own sort of Tonawixla project. Tonawixla is this 
rural community he works with in the mountains of the Sierra Mixteca in Mexico, a tiny town. I think it's about 300 people. Um, and he's, all his work in the last 10 years has really focused on regenerating that community in terms of, uh, so they've suffered from erosion, they've suffered from migration, all the problems that rural communities in Mexico and elsewhere uh, suffer from. And his Totomoshtle project, which promoted regrowing native corns in this area uh, by the, the incentive to grow these corns is a new craft that he created with the town, which is this beautiful corn leaf sort of marquetry uh, that he uses in some of his pieces. Um, so he's generated, then he started growing agaves to improve the quality of the earth and hold water. Uh, and he started using the agave fibers to produce his other work. So it's it's this cyclical, it's incredible the way he works and his mind operates and his own sort of philosophy of design works. And so these are uh, dead cactus stumps that he's also found in this community. Um, and it, it actually has the thorns of of these cactus. It's a beautiful piece, but he incorporates like the cactus fruits bulbs are 3D printed. So it's really about this very sort of non-conformist uh, approach to natural, artificial, contemporary, historic crafts and machine made. Really a super emblematic um, for the show. Yeah. Here we see a couple of details of a couple of last works. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're just reaching the end of our time, Mario. So uh, with your permission, I'll take down the images and just see, because we have um, a couple of our colleagues here. I don't know if Renata Del Riego, who was very helpful on the project at the gallery, or Stephen would like to ask a question before we close. Hey guys. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> fantastic conversation, really, really fantastic. Yeah. Um, Mario, I love I love the way you speak about the informal and and improvisation as such a part of Mexican identity. And I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more about that and the importance of, um, I guess, movements like you know the ready made or or pop art as it relates to how we perceive pop art in America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think informality for uh, the better part of the 20th century, informality was something that we had to erase from our culture, like to become modern, uh, like the, the most visible sort of architectural or design gestures in the 20th century was erasing these informal settlements in the 1960s, mm -hmm. Tlatelolco, Mario Pani, building these huge um, sort of rationalists, Corbusian architect architecture to supplant it. So architecture specifically, but design in general has very much been against informality for a really long time. And I think after seeing sort of the failure of that mode of thinking and producing uh, and the permanence of informality as a resource and really a way of blossoming for so many people in Mexico. I think designers are finally embracing it as an important um, aspect and sort of core aspect of practice in a place like Mexico. Um, and yeah, so I, I do think it's a, it's a very different sort of critique and approach than what happens to the US in the US with like sort of these pop art or appropriations or, or references. Um, and I think it's more, uh, yeah, it's really something that's very grounded in, in making um, in a place like this. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, Renata, last that's question, good. if you have one. Oh. Oh, sorry, Malika, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, I just have a quick question about design education in Mexico. I was just really curious to understand um, what is some of the history of the way that design is taught in, in Mexico? And maybe what are the tensions between, as you say, informality and formality? 
So yeah, it's something like like Glenn had mentioned. I think design education at the very beginning in Mexico in the in the early 20th century was tied to art architecture. So it was this very sort of holistic view of design as a cultural practice. And then in the 60s and 70s, there was a really strong shift to sort of professional formation for industry. And lots of the programs that schools have now are from the 60s or 70s. So it's it's a completely sort of like a paradigm that is no longer works in terms of like the contemporary context, but it doesn't work in the vision of how design can sort of reinvent itself either with this original sort of holistic view. Um, so that's a huge problem. Um, and schools, I think, have been very late to catch up. Some are trying to sort of redesign design education. Um, but it's also like in, in Mexico, you have to choose your, uh, so we don't have like this college sort of, um, sort of um, structure where you can choose your major, minor, or a master's as you move along. So really kids go into school knowing that they want to become a designer or an architect when they're like 17. So that's also an issue, I think. Um, but yeah, I think um, what's been incredible in the last 10 years is that the void in sort of institutional backing in museums and sort of these cultural conversations have created a network of sort of informal organic organizations that fill in the gaps. And there's a real liberty of critique, of thinking and of making. I mean, kids in Mexico are building when they're in their twenties, you know, you don't have to wait till you're like 40 something and like a registered architect to build a house here. So um, I think again, that the same informality that Steven was talking about fills in some of the gaps in the education and the way um, sort of a lot of designers are, are self-taught as well here. It's like the advantages and disadvantages of deinstitutionalization or or static institutionalization, as the case may be in Mexico. Um, okay, let's. I have time for yeah for one more question. Thank you, Mario. Um, I think I really am still thinking of what both you and Glenn discussed um, of what Archivo really was trying to do and opening up the archive and having people interact with with these things that we live with but we don't really understand. As, as individual objects um, and, and this idea of, of opening it up for people to understand the object. And you can only understand the object when you see it, when you touch it, when you're with it. Um, and, I, and so I think with that idea, I'm interested to know you personally, what with this saturation of objects and textures and colors and you know the material landscape of Mexico and Mexico City, what draws you to a particular texture or material quality that that then makes you curate these amazing projects difficult i mean i think and i think it's very present in the show at friedman benda i'm drawn to people that are challenging the status quo i'm drawn to objects that sort of sit on the margins of these professional disciplines or practices i'm drawn to um things that are visceral and evocative and i think that's a constant in a lot of contemporary production in in mexico at the moment and they're misfits i love that all the people in the group in in the show are are misfits they're fashion designers that were trained as engineers architects like bringing down architecture or doing art um you know artisans querying craft and I think that's for me the most interesting element, like signature of of production in Mexico today, the diversity and sort of the, the audacity in a way to really push boundaries. Well, audacity is a really nice word to end on and definitely uh, fits your practice as well as those that you're uh, giving a platform to Mario. So thank you so much for spending this time with us. Thank you for doing the show at the gallery. Uh, it's a real- Thank you so much, guys. Contribution, real success. And um, out there, everyone, tune in for uh, the next interviews that Mario and Steven will be doing uh, here on Design and Dialogue. Thanks for, thanks for watching. Bye. Bye. Thank you.